yes, trailblazers. Um, hopefully, this uh, talk will explain what we're about. If you if you haven't heard of us, I've changed my title. It was a bit boring before, um, and I hadn't written the talk yet, so I've written it now, and the title fits the talk a bit better. Um, so let's start. Okay. Okay, so this talk has two strands to it. It has some bedtime stories, which are wonderful, nice things to share, and some more sort of exciting ideas that come very well on the heels of the talk that we just had. I just want to say that everything that Trailblazers does is based on the work of many who have come before, not only historical research, but also groups like the BWA who have been there already, showing everyone, or us at least, that there was something already embedded there, concerns that people had, and that's what we've built on, so we are grateful for that. So, let's start with this prologue for the story. We're going to 1894. Um, Rachel reminded us of some of the history of, of women and women's rights, and this is Margaret Murray. Um, I don't have a photo of her from her youth. This is uh, one of the younger ones of her at the top there, where she's unwrapping a mummy. So in 1894, she started as a student at UCL studying the newish course of Egyptology that had just begun. Within five years, she was the first woman lecturer in archaeology, um, as Egyptology will we'll allow that, that's archaeology. <laughs> um, so Margaret Murray is interesting because she <coughs> was for a long time overlooked um, she spent decades working at UCL um, she wasn't promoted to Flinders Petrie's professorship although she should have been really um, she did get an honorary doctorate but her students had to pay for her robes because she couldn't afford them um, by the time she was 100, um, she was honoured with a, a lovely ceremony. Uh, she has a bust in the Petrie Museum, um, and she has a biography uh, written by Catherine Shepherd. But she's still barely known outside of historical archaeology specialists, um, never mind the rest of archaeology, never mind wider culture. Um, yet she is she's a pioneer, so we want to kind of, in this talk, follow her a little bit alongside following what Trailblazers is about. So, chapter one in the Trailblazers story. So, we started out in 2012. We are four women. We, we are, were early career then, we sort of still are, I don't know. I don't know what my career is now, anyway. Um, three archaeologists, one paleobiologist, um, working in three countries, two continents, uh, we weren't being connected by Telegram, as Margaret Murray was, but by Twitter. Um, and as many things do, it started on Twitter. Um, there was some perception around that time. There was that really horrendous EU women in science video. Do you remember that? That sort of was just like lipsticks and pink lab coats or whatever. Um, and another group sort of span off that called Science Girl to basically say, no, you know, we need to be a lot more nuanced and sophisticated about how we're trying to present science careers to girls. And that was the sort of the scene within which Trailblazers started, where essentially people were complaining on Twitter um, how there's no real sort of wider cultural sort of promotion of women's role in archaeology, although there was stuff going in profession. Um, in, in a cultural sense, it wasn't especially visible. Um, and so people said, well, just do something about it then. So the four of us said, okay, let's, let's do something. Um, and so we launched a Tumblr in 2013 um, and realised quite quickly that that wasn't going to be enough. Um, we had a lot of people wanting to submit posts on women to us. So the idea was that we had nice photos on Tumblr with a little bit of text, but actually... People wanted to know more about the women they wanted to write for us. So we upgraded and we uh, developed a website. So we've got like more than 200 posts on the website and a lot more in a database that people send to us. Oh, have you heard of this one? So that goes in. Um, so that's kind of where we are 
now, um, and that's the beginning of, of what Trailblazers was. So <clears throat> we go to interlude one. Now we are in 1902. So Margaret Murray has been digging in Egypt for some time. She's an expert, but she's not alone. Um, in 1902, um, in the back of the tomb of Seti I, there was some strange lumpiness in the desert, and Petrie's team uncovered the Osiron, which is a temple. And Margaret Murray was digging this, alongside this woman who was Hilda Erlin, afterwards Hilda Petrie, um, so Flinders Petrie's wife. She was um, very interesting. She was an independent uh, woman who was already very talented before she met Petrie. She was into nature, geology, art. She was training all those things. And she was introduced to Petrie in 1895, so only a year after Margaret Murray started um, her course. Um, Margaret Murray's a bit older than her. Um, by the artist who painted this portrait of her um, as a pre-Raphaelite, um, but yes. And she met Fernandez and he was basically bowled away by her because she was into archaeology and she wanted to go digging in Egypt, which is all his life was. Um, and although she's kind of very much represented as the partner of, she, she was a lot more than that. Um, <clears throat> They basically left their own honeymoon breakfast to jump on the train to go to Egypt immediately. She couldn't wait to get into the field. Um, as soon as they got to Giza, she threw her skirt off and started climbing the pyramid. She was well into it. Um, and she did undertake huge amounts of work by herself. She would do drawings. Um, she would do cataloguing. She wrote the field journals. Um, she did some excavation, not very much because nobody really did much. You had local work people to do that mostly. But she managed the staff, and she did okay. she did loads of stuff. Um, and she co-dug sites with other women. So they, she dug this site, the Asylum, with Hilda Petrie. Um, so immediately in the early 20th century, you've already got women working in teams independently together, um, which is not something you tend to hear a lot about. Um, we have proof of this from the book that Margaret Murray published on this temple that they dug together. This is some of the illustrations, and if you zoom in, you can see on that figure, Hilda Petrie, Margaret Alice Murray, that's their work together, collaborating, which is nice. And this is them together in old age. Um, this was at, uh, I think it was at a celebration to do with uh, the Petries. Um, although Hilda was a decade younger, um, Margaret survived her and wrote her obituary for the Times in 1956 and then wrote her own autobiography uh, entitled, wonderfully, My First Hundred Years, which is <laughs> spectacular. <laughs> um, but they weren't the only women on Petrie's, uh, the Petrie's, plural excavations. This is Hilda's sister, Amy. She was there doing stuff as well. Um, and there were other women. So this is back to their publication on that temple. And um, this is some more of the uh, recordings of graffiti. This is Greek graffiti on the tomb, which is pretty cool anyway. And down there, those letters, that's Margaret Alice Murray again and Lena Eckenstein, another woman who was working there. Um, and Petrie, Hilda Petrie and uh, Lena Eckenstein were at one point instructed by Flinders to stay where they were because he'd gone off and found somewhere very exciting far in the desert that was too dangerous. So they ignored that, um, got on a train and then a boat, took six days uh, going through the desert on camels. It was completely Indiana Jones with whips and pistols and camping and you know, campfires. So there are so many really nice stories that are still inspiring to us today. Why should they be inspiring? Because we just don't hear those narratives very much. Um, so, on to chapter two from our interlude. This is chapter two in the Trailblazers story again. So after we'd sort of initially been excited and sort of been like, oh, let's write about this woman, let's write about this woman, we started to think, no, this isn't about individual women, although they're all fantastic. This is about looking at women, plural, women together. Um, women are wonderful, but they're not decorative. What are stars when you see them close up? They're blazing explosions, you know, with nuclear furnaces at their core. Um, we noticed, of course, um, we're not historians of archaeology. When I say we did these things, it's our experience of it. It's not our work. Many others 
did the research that we then rediscovered. Um, women were not anomalies ever in the history of archaeology. Um, there were always loads of them, loads more than get into the, the records. If you look in the acknowledgements of, of reports back for decades and decades and decades, there's always more names in there. Um, sometimes you don't know who they are. And the way that we have experienced running trailblazers is an echo of the development of feminist and gender archaeology, this idea that we initially sort of noticed the women and that was great, but actually you need to look beyond the individual women, you need to look at how things connect um, and what that means, basically. And what we started to, to get really excited about was this sort of repetitive pattern that you look at one woman, she was mentored by another one. She, her, that person was trained by someone a generation before. And all the time there are these really strong networks that cover generations um, and they're pioneers. You know, so many of them are, are giving not only their skills but their experience of, of being a pioneer. And that goes forward. And so you can take sort of another woman if you want to take this network approach. So we looked at Dorothy Garrard, um, when we first sort of got excited about this. Um, Dorothy Garrard, if you, if you don't know, is uh, the first woman professor in Oxbridge and a pioneer in uh, prehistory, not only in Britain, but globally at the time. Um, she did uh, a lot of um, important excavations with some Neanderthals, which are my thing, so I like, I like that aspect. But yeah, you stick Dorothy Garrard in the middle and you've just got this instant massive network of people that connect to her through many different um, reasons. So down here, you've got Hilda is there, there's Margaret Murray. Um, they all connect to tons of others. And it just, you know, this is only a partial thing. We could have done it bigger than this. You can take any one of those women and do that. Um, so we, we, you know, we sort of had a fun game saying six degrees of separation. How many people does it take for you to connect to Dorothy Garrett? And it's only about two. I mean, okay, archaeology is a small world, small like Hollywood. <laughs> But, you know, it's still interesting um, that there are these connections there for, for so many of us. Um, <clears throat> and this idea of connections is something that we've carried through to later projects. So, interlude two. Now we're in 1932. <coughs> um, and these are different women. So at the top you have Dorothy Garrett, who we just spoke about um, in her younger days. And below her is Jaquetta, then Hopkins, later Jaquetta Hawkes, um, who at the time was 22. She had just been given a travel bursary from Oxford, where she'd been working with uh, Garrett um, as a high scoring student to go and excavate with Dorothy Garrett um, at her big dig in Mount Carmel in Palestine, which had been running since 1929. And this is kind of a theme that I think is a something that's important for us to remember in, in the work that we do is that it's about, it's about joy as well. And some of the nicest things that have come out of doing the Trailblazers Project is sort of finding those little threads of what those experiences meant to women in the past. So Jaquetta, while she was there, she became, uh, she did archaeology, she didn't do much field archaeology later, but she became like a multimedia archaeologist. She was a writer, a poet, she did... Um, graphic work, she did exhibitions, uh, but while she was there, she was young, she was in love, um, and she wrote this journal, which is really amazing. It's at um, the University of Bradford, anyone can go to the archives and read it. But there's, uh, there's one nice thing, one day in October, they've been at the site for weeks, it's a pretty hard site, they all get ill all the time, and it's um, sort of living in dodgy tents and things, um, and they had a day off. So this is her description of, of their day at the beach. Perfection, the curve of sand, the shadowed castle, orange sunset over the sea facing the silver moonrise, full moon climbing up, flocks of dark goats approaching through the dusk silent on the sand, crabs flickering along on high legs. The engulfing warmth of the sea, fish leaps and hits me in the face, how I remember the smell and the excitement of it. Comic interlude, cocktails in the mess tent, the captain with his polished red face. Return to the beach, a marvellous supper party, all of us excited from our surroundings and perhaps the cocktails. Racing on the hard sand and then the jolting drive home. Elizabeth, Dorothy and I, almost hysterical, all moonstruck. And I just 
think that that's something we have to hold on to, that we talk about women in the past, but they had that connection to archaeology that we all have, which is why we do it. And Jaquetta, 10 years ago, was still profoundly affected by this experience when she was a young woman. She wrote um, several poems um, in some books about poetry and some other landscape-related books. One of the things that was most affecting was that while she was digging this site, that year they found a female Neanderthal, and uh, she excavated that partly um, with a local woman called Yusra, who found it, who was a Palestinian excavator as well. And she wrote poems about this Neanderthal as well, talking about women whose ancient cloak of flesh I wear. And there's just this sort of depth to it, and I think we need to hold on to that too in what we do today. So... Chapter three on the Trailblazers story. So we, what underpins us, what's our passion is resetting imaginations. We don't just want to say, hey, they were in here, hey, they did stuff. We want to change the imaginations of people in the profession about how we feel about ourselves, what we can do, but also the next generation coming along. That's why we're still doing what we're doing. Um, and these ideas about collaboration and passion and an emotional connection with what we're doing is what underpins what we are about. So this is the four of us here um, at the launch of, um, of uh, one of our big projects. <clears throat> so Brenna, one of us, Brenna likes to call us a hydra-headed anarchic democracy and somehow it does work um, through multiple time zones and confusion of life. Um, but now we we are surprisingly sort of big um, in terms of what we've achieved. And we were never planning to sort of, we never had a, a ground plan or a future plan or anything. So it's been organic. 80% of the posts that are on our website now are crowdsourced. People who are engaged with this, they want to contribute to it. They want to be part of this story. A lot of those posts come from people in the heritage sector or professional archeologists, but also you just get random people who are interested, people who are family members of the women they're talking to, but also people who worked with those women. So it, it's not just sort of an encyclopedia, it is a community. Um, and we've really sort of branched out more into working with external partners in many ways. Uh, so we've done, we do talks, we've done publications, we've done various sort of performance things, and we also worked on developing the Fossil Hunter Lottie doll um, there, which is still love hearing from kids who like playing with it it's just awesome um so that's kind of where where we are but we the biggest thing that we've done which is still ongoing is this project which was the raising horizons um exhibition which essentially uh, was a collaboration with an artist who approached us um lenora saunders um other women you know, we're, we're thinking about these issues too in, in wider context. And she approached us wanting to do a series of portraits of uh, basically women archaeologists posed as their historic forebears, but she knew nothing about archaeology. Um, so she said, do you think this is cool? And we were like, oh my God, yeah. So um, I worked with her for a year to develop that. Um, we had to fund it. So we did a crowdfunding campaign. And we had tons and tons of people really you know, passionate enough to put a little bit of money behind it. Um, and some big sponsors, some big organisational sponsors supported us as well. Um, that's been going for two years. It's uh, coming up to its 12th venue and it's starting to go again next year. So that's, that's something that gives us joy. You know, that's been an amazing experience. So I'll just indulge by showing a few of the little pictures and things from it. So the, the ones at the top are from the crowdfunding video we did. So that's uh, Tori with her daughter. That's my little one in the Society of Antiquaries chair, actually ripping up one of their very precious books while we were filming. Oh, dear. <laughs> Rachel might recognise herself in the middle as Margaret Guido. And these are some of the behind-the-scenes um, <coughs> shots from the exhibition we did. So we've got Rachel Bino as, uh, on a frost in the diving suit. In the middle, we have Colleen Morgan as Jaquetta Hawks. And on the right, we have Peggy Brunash, um, who was posing as Gertrude Caton Thompson. Um, and here are some of those portraits as they looked. So we have uh, the, uh, Kathleen Kenyon there, posed by Shahina Farid, who works for English Heritage. Um, she's supposed to be on her first excavation as a young woman where she was busy not only 
digging Great Zimbabwe, no, no big deal, um, with Kathleen, uh, with uh, Gertrude Kate and Thompson. She was also doing the mechanic, so she's got a spanner in her pocket, and we borrowed a real 1930s camera. And in the middle, there is our wonderful <laughs> Rachel Pope there, eyeing up a bead, um, as Margaret Guido. And uh, on, the, uh, on the left is, um, uh, is, Gertrude, is uh, sorry, so many names, Dorothy Garrard, and it's Nikki Milner who was posing as her, so that was wonderful. And the launch, this was the launch that we had two years ago in the Geological Society in London. Um, not only did the portraits look beautiful, but actually having women there seeing themselves in the portraits was really special. And, and also having that space filled up by women was really significant as well. Several people said that. They said they've never seen so many women in that room ever at one time. You know, and you're surrounded by other portraits of, of the great and the good men and one lonely portrait of Mary Anning somewhere in the hall, I think. Um, and this is uh, Amara Thornton as Margaret Murray. So we come back to Margaret Murray here again. Um, she's just in the middle of her mummy unwrapping. And she's actually holding a little uh, doll, uh, a little knitted outfit that somebody had made for a lot. I think that was Emma Ridden at um, uh, Society of Antiquaries in Scotland. So that was just wonderful, sort of having all these connections, going from Margaret Murray through to Amara, who is a historical archaeologist who researches the 1930s and 20s and the connections between people at that time. So there's just this lovely sort of amalgam of, of all the ideas that are important to us. And so Margaret Murray is good to come back to here because it's not just about pioneers and connections, it's about lessons to learn from our forebears or our foremothers, if you want to say it that way. So here's the epilogue. Where do we go from here as, as trailblazers? Um, it's six years since we started. Um, as I said, this was an unplanned baby. <laughs> we weren't expecting to, to sort of go anywhere. We just thought, oh, let's start a website. And it's kind of grown. Um, so we are thinking, you know, what happens? So where do we go from here? Well, world domination is one option. Um, we can start with Parliament. This is just a couple of weeks ago. Was it only a week? I can't remember. Uh, some of the portraits were shown at Parliament, which was amazing. And some of the women here were there. Um, and that was a great experience, sort of being part of an event that was celebrating the centenary of the vote for women um, and sort of being, being in, the, in the seat of power was uh, an interesting experience. But, but seriously, Margaret Murray, was, she was a pioneer, she was a role model, she was a teacher, but she did more than that. She worked to actively better the structures within which she was. So... She taught women, she trained women, but she also took the time to establish a women's common room uh, at UCL. She established uh, a unisex student canteen. They were both very male areas. She did that. She was a suffrage uh, campaigner. We want to do more than that. We want to have access, impact, diversity, conditions. We want to follow that model. And, uh, and having access to power is important. So we have a lot of ideas, but funding and logistics are issues for everybody. <laughs> For BWA as well, um, we have some plans. We have we want to start doing a platform to share the platform. We have to do a rotating um, sort of account uh, thing for Twitter in January, and we're also starting to take consulting work separate to the non-profit stuff that we do because we get approached all the time, and we're going to say yes, we can do that now. And just to come back to Parliament to finish off, um, something I did notice not very long ago was that uh, the all-party parliamentary archaeology group is almost all men um, and uh, yeah there's one woman on it now and whether or not all the men of the bodies that take part in that or the leaders of those or the, the, the highest ranking person happens to be a man that should be something that those men who go into that room are saying uh, this isn't right we need to do something we need to bring in women to share these posts so I just think the whole thing about parliament and power and not asking anymore is important. So Trailblazers has always been community-based. We would like to hear from everybody what you think has worked, what you think we haven't done well, and where we can go from here. So thank you very much.